Hi everyone, what I want to do is get into chapter three and start talking about uh, Lebesgue measurable functions. So the idea behind doing Lebesgue measurable functions is that, uh, well, we basically covered uh, Lebesgue measurable sets in as much detail as we need. So we want to kind of start uh, working towards a uh, good uh, integration theory that builds on the uh, theory of Lebesgue measurable sets. And the functions that we're going to be able to integrate are roughly measurable functions. Okay, so, um, right. So, um, right, so we're gonna talk, be talking about Lebesgue. I'll write down a definition in a second. And I'll explain in a second why we're, we're, you know, the definition I'm going to be giving is called, you know, is uh, called a measurable, the definition of a measurable function. I'll let you know, you know, in what sense the function is measurable. So, um, so first of all, I want to make uh, something, just get something out of the way. So from now on, all functions f are going to be from some subset of the real line. That hasn't changed. But they're going to go uh, from uh, e, some, some subset of the real line, to um, the extended real numbers r plus or minus infinity. And there's nothing really too funky going on. The reason um, you know, we want to do that is uh, within this integration process that will, um, well, we probably won't get to it, but it's, it's uh, I, I have videos on if you want to learn about it. Um, we want to be able to uh, take the integral of something like zero to one of x to the minus one half dx. Um, So we want to, let's say, not do, but we want to define without taking limits. So uh, we know the formal definition of this uh, as a Riemann integral. Well, it technically doesn't exist as a Riemann integral because Riemann integrable functions on a closed interval are bounded. But the definition as a Riemann, uh, as a limit of a Riemann integral is, you know, the obvious calc two definition. It's, this is limit as epsilon goes to zero plus of epsilon to one x minus one half. And this is going to be um, two x to one half, uh, really limit. So it's going to be one to epsilon. And of course, this is just going to be uh, two. Plug in epsilon, let epsilon go to zero. So this is just cumbersome, um, you know, and we really want to uh, be able to do this integral without taking limits or define at least this integral without taking limits. And well, this function here on zero to one it's not real value, but it does fit within this context here. It spits out real numbers, and at zero, it spits out plus infinity. So, um, so very yeah. There's very practical reasons to look at functions that are formally, um, uh, you know, that are uh, spit out real numbers or plus or minus infinity. Okay, so uh, just note that the convention here we're going to use is that zero times infinity, uh, zero times plus or minus infinity is uh, zero. 
Um, you know, we're not doing any little Patal's rule type stuff here where, you know, like limits of the form zero times infinity can be anything. Uh, we're just formally defining zero times infinity to be zero. Um, on the other hand, something like infinity minus infinity or infinity plus infinity, uh, we're not defining it. And uh, for the time being, you can just pretend I didn't say anything uh, here. We'll get back to this later. And the reason why we want this to be true is, well, unless we define you know, zero times plus or minus infinity to be zero, some of the theorems we'll state are just wrong. Uh, for example, if f is a measurable, if f is a function that's zero almost everywhere on the real line, we want the integral of that over the real line to be zero, because in some sense, you're integrating zero in some sense. Uh, the set where f is not zero has measure zero, that should be uh, zero. Um, so that, you know, that unless we define zero times infinity to be zero, that's not true um, necessarily. So. Okay, uh, right, so let's just immediately dive into the definition of uh, a measurable function. So we have the following proposition, following our equivalents. Now I'm doing the same thing uh, the book does. Um, I'm gonna differ a little bit then, Royden, uh, when we start adding and multiplying measurable functions, but uh, I'm just gonna be a little more efficient than uh, Royden is, but. Okay, so first of all, let's assume, and we're always throughout this video, we're gonna assume that E is measurable. Okay? So it doesn't make sense to discuss F being measurable or not if the domain is not even measurable. So the domain is gonna be measurable. Uh, one, and I'm going to use, you know, like the book, um, going to use uh, lowercase Roman numerals. For any real number C, the inverse image of C uh, excluding C to infinity uh, is measurable. Okay. Two, for any C and R, um, the inverse image of uh, C, including C to infinity, including infinity, is measurable. Uh, three, well, you get the point. Um, and I'll prove this. The proof uh, is very easy of this proposition. I could give it for homework, but it's in the book, so not very useful as a homework. So basically the complement statements of one and two, respectively. Um, here we're including, uh, sorry, here we're including C and including infinity. Here we're including minus infinity rather and including, and not including C. Here we're including minus infinity and we are including including minus infinity, not including C, including minus infinity, including C, sorry about that. Okay, um, right, so I'll write this down, but um, if F satisfies any of these four equivalent conditions, then we say F is a measurable function on E. And the idea is that, uh, you know, why do we say F is measurable? Well, we can measure, i.e. 
uh, Lebesgue measure behaves well on all of these sets, uh, these very useful uh, sets, the inverse image of uh, these intervals. Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the inverse image of open sets, whether that's measurable not, or not, if F is measurable in a moment. All right, so uh, let me try to go quick. It's proof, because it is pretty straightforward. Uh, so you just do kind of the obvious thing. So we want to prove, what do we want to do? We're assuming each one of these is measurable, and we want to prove that when we include C, this is also measurable. Yeah, so we do the obvious thing. We write this as a uh, intersection. So including uh, or C to infinity, including C and including infinity is the same thing as the intersection of going to the left a tiny bit, but not including that endpoint. So uh, C minus one over N to infinity. Uh, the intersection for all n equals one to infinity. That's really trivial. Uh, and just, yeah, do what we've been doing before. Uh, uh, inverse image of a um, intersection is the intersection of the inverse image. Well, each one of these by one is uh, immeasurable, is, is measurable, it's in script M. And a countable intersection of measurable sets is measurable. So, um, right, really not much to that. We're assuming each one of these is measurable. So, so each one of these here is measurable. Right. So uh, if we want to do two implies three, um, all we do is really take uh, complements, pretty much. Um, so we want to show that each one of these is uh, measurable. Okay, so uh, yeah, we just look at this here, inverse image of minus infinity. Wait. Sorry about that, my microphone uh, fell off. Okay, so uh, this is just going to be the complement of uh, C uh, to infinity, including C. And that is the um, uh, inverse image of the whole complement. And so because what's inside is measurable, complement of a measurable set is measurable. So, so by two, uh, this is, um, two is that each one of these is measurable. Okay, uh, three, so I did one implies two, two implies three, now let's do three implies four. Right. Um, yeah, basically the same thing, not much to this here. Instead of writing, instead of using um, intersections, we use unions. Uh, no, sorry, we do intersections still. So there's an intersection again of uh, going, well, to the right by a little one over N. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so assuming three is true, uh, so each one of these, well, each one of these is in, uh, measurable. So this is measurable, okay? Right, so the whole thing, countable, again, countable intersection of measurable sets is uh, measurable. Okay, and lastly, four implies one. Uh, again, this is just um, really not much to this. Just complements. Uh, this is going to be the inverse image of minus infinity to C, complement, and pull the complement out. And this is measurable because what's inside the complement is measurable by four. Right. right, each one of these is assumed to be measurable. Okay, uh, right, so, um, right, so I won't write it down, but again, that, you know, we define F to be measurable if any of these, I guess I'll write it down just because it's so important. So we say F is measurable and there's no real symbol, useful symbol for measurable functions like script M is for um, um, measurable sets, but uh, and this definition is vacuous. It makes, we don't define measurability of a function if E, the domain, is not measurable. If this here satisfies Any of the equivalent uh, conditions one through uh, four. Right, so, um, right, so let's build up the theory here. And the theory of measurable functions is not too uh, bad. So, little proposition here kind of highlights the reason why we need the flexibility of uh, really assuming all four of these are, are true. We want to prove that if F is measurable, and I should say if the, the, the specific domain is not super important, um, then I'll just say F is measurable rather than just saying F is measurable on E. So if F is measurable, then um, the inverse image of a singleton and here C could be anything real or plus or minus infinity. All right, so what's the proof? Uh, proof is uh, pretty easy, just you got two cases. 
if C is real, and if C is well, not fake, but if C is uh, plus or minus infinity. So if C is real, then, um, yeah, so just write this as the intersection of two measurable functions. So it's just gonna be the inverse image of minus infinity to C intersect the inverse image of C to infinity. That's pretty obvious. Um, it's gotta be in both of these. You know, it's gotta be between minus infinity and C and C to infinity, including both of them C. It's kind of trivial. So by measurability, um, I guess this is uh, uh, minus infinity to C is uh, which one? Um, by four and by two, both of these are measurable. So by uh, four and two, both of these are measurable. So the intersection of measurable sets is measurable. Actually, sorry, there's gonna be three cases. If C equals uh, plus infinity, well, this is, uh, you can do, uh, write this in kind of the obvious way. It's the intersection and uh, I think this is in the book, otherwise I would give it for homework, but uh, that's right. Yeah, so uh, it has to be in every single one of these sets. It has to be an n to infinity for every single, um, for every single uh, n. Okay. Well, this here, um, by uh, well, two or four, doesn't matter. Each one of these is measurable by assumption, by measurability. So the countable intersection of measurable sets is measurable. Uh, this one is basically the same. Just do minus infinity to minus n. Uh, by measurability, each one of these is measurable. So the countable intersection is measurable. All right, so another uh, very useful proposition is the following. Um, If F is real valued, again, E is assumed measurable. So when we say this is measurable, I'm still thinking of F as uh, taking E and spitting out something R union plus or minus infinity. It just happens to be real valued. So when I write this, I really, I, I, you know, I'm, the definition of this being measurable is really the same. Uh, maybe I'll make this a little clearer. So if we have a function f, Where f of x is real for any x and r, and often I'll just write the, uh, I mean, theoretically these are different functions, but practically they're the same damn function. You know, I hope there's not gonna be any distress uh, basically equating these two functions. Um, So 
So F is measurable in this case, if and only if the inverse image of every open set is measurable. All right, so before I prove this, I want to make a very important remark. This makes no sense whatsoever in general for a um, extended real valued function. Uh, extended real valued, as I mentioned, meaning it spits out R union, spits out stuff in R or possibly plus or minus infinity. The reason is well, there's no natural topology here. There, there's just no natural topology on this uh, set. Um, oftentimes, on R union, you know, infinity, not two elements, but one element infinity. You often kind of uh, think of infinity as, uh, you know, you think of like a point of infinity and you kind of um, sort of like taking the real line and wrapping it around to get the circle. Um, so it's the compact, one point compactification of the real line. Uh, and that, that's fine. That's not nothing too funky about that. If you've taken topology, you've done that. But really, we have two points here, plus and minus infinity. So there's just no natural good topology here. So it doesn't make sense to, to, to speak of open sets here. It's just meaningless to speak of open sets or open subsets of R union plus or minus infinity. So we don't, and we just don't even, it's, it's, we don't even bother with any version of this in general for extended real valued functions. Again, extended real valued functions, meaning a function that genuinely possibly spits out plus or minus infinity, including real values. Okay, so the proof of this is very straightforward. Um, really not all that much to this. Uh, you know, we're going to use that proposition nine in the book, get a lot of mileage out of that really nice proposition. And you rarely, rarely even use the fact that the sets uh, are disjoint in proposition nine. It's, you know, every open set is the, the disjoint union of um, open intervals. Uh, all right, so let's assume F is measurable. Um, well, uh, yeah, so, so assume F is measurable, right? So let's give this a name. Let's call this, uh, star blue. So it's blue or blue asterisk star, whatever. All right, so let's assume uh, F is measurable. Um, so let's get two trivial cases out of the way. Well, the empty set, the inverse image of the empty set, set of all X where F of X is empty. Well, it's empty, there's nothing. Plug in anything, you either get a real number. Well, you get a real number if you plug in anything. Um, and also, inverse image of a uh, real line is well, E. For any X in E, F of X is a real number. So uh, these are two open sets whose inverse image is measurable. So without loss of generality, let's assume um, that theta is not the empty set 
And it's a strictly proper subset of real line. Right. All right, so as before, write theta as the disjoint union of open intervals, but we don't, you know, we don't care that it's a disjoint union, we just care that it's a union of open intervals. All right, and we have the annoying possibility of one of them, or, you know, multi one of them, or, well, not both of them are not minus infinity and plus infinity, respectively. But one of them could be minus infinity, and one of them could be plus infinity. So if AK is minus infinity, BK is real. Again, both of them can't be minus infinity and plus infinity, respectively. That's taking the inverse image uh, of, um, well, that means, sorry, that means theta obviously is a whole real line. Okay, so if this is the case, then the inverse image minus infinity to a, uh, to BK rather, uh, this is measurable by, um, well, I should say, why is this measurable? Well, this is the same thing as including minus infinity because F is never equal to minus infinity. In general, these two sets can be very different, but we're assuming F is real valued, so these two sets are equal. And by measurability, uh, I forget which number, but measurability, one of them, this is measurable. Right? Um, Similarly, the inverse image of AK is real, then this here is going to be the inverse image of AK to infinity. Uh, And uh, again, by, by measurability, uh, I forget which one, one through four this is, but one of them, this is gonna be measurable. Um, and if they're both real, then we can just do um, kind of the obvious thing here that we've done before. This is going to be um, inverse image of minus infinity to BK. Uh, I have to make this a little smaller, move this over a bit. So it's the inverse image of minus infinity to BK intersection well, it's got to be f of x you know, uh, has to be uh, less than bk and bigger than ak. So here it's going to be a k to infinity. And again, because f is real valued, these two are the same. In general, they could be vastly different sets, but we're assuming it's real valued. And so this is going to be measurable. Okay, uh, so what does this mean? The inverse image of theta is gonna be the union of the inverse image of AK, BK, and either way, this is going to be, um, well, this is going to be measurable.
Okay, so uh, let's prove the converse. So if we have that uh, star is true, or asterisk and blue, whatever, Okay, um, then, um, well, there's really not much to this. For any uh, real number C, as we said before, uh, because F is real value, this is going to be um, C to infinity. And obviously this is an open interval. So this is open. And by assumption, this is measurable, and hence f is a measurable function. Okay, so homework will be a uh, close companion of this. If all we assume is that f is a measurable real, extended real valued uh, function, Extended real valued meaning it uh, you know spits out possibly plus or minus infinity, but otherwise it just spits out real numbers. But plus or minus infinity is possible. So if this is measurable on E, then this is measurable. For any uh, open, well, theta subset of uh, the extended real numbers, and I should say, uh, I'm going to call, I in the book uh, call this set the extended real numbers or the extended reals, same thing. That doesn't make sense, theta is a subset of the extended real numbers, but of course it makes sense to say theta is uh, subset of the real numbers and it's real. Okay. So if F is measurable, the inverse image of an open set is in fact measurable. It's just that the converse, you're not, converse is not strong enough to uh, conclude that F is measurable in general. Okay, um, so I just wanna remind you about a fact, uh, a fact about uh, continuous functions. So if I have any E as a subset of the real numbers whatsoever, and I have a, a real valued function on E, then this function is continuous on E, if and only if, by continuous I mean the usual epsilon delta uh, definition. So we have a more topological definition. Um, and if you haven't seen this before, just take it for granted. It's not a, not a big deal. Uh, for any theta open, there exists open U where F, the inverse image of theta is well, relatively open in E, meaning it's an open subset of the real line intersect E. Okay. So with this fact here, um, we have the very easy result very easy proposition that um, if f is a real valued um, measurable function, And again, this is exactly the same thing as saying, maybe more germane to what we've been doing. Well, 
Well, f is extended real valued. But in fact, it's real valued. Okay, so if we have such a function uh, that's measurable, um, sorry, it's continuous, then it's measurable. All right, so what's the proof? Well, there's not much really to the proof. Um, if theta is uh, open in R, then this is going to be, um, well, U intersect E for some uh, open U. Okay. That's basically it. That's really the whole proof. Um, we're assuming this is measurable. This is, this is open, so it's measurable. So the inverse image of any open subset of the real line is measurable. And that's enough for measurability for these kinds of functions. Whoops, it's black. Like that. Okay, so um, yeah, so in fact, we'll prove later that as long as F is increasing on a measurable uh, set, then F itself is a measurable function. That's a little harder and we'll do that. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So my immediate goal is to turn uh, the set of all extended, real-valued, measurable functions into a vector space. Okay, so that's my goal here. Uh, let me make this a little smaller. I'll leave this here for now. Well, we, we just can't do this. Um, problem is, well, if f of x is plus infinity, g of x is minus infinity, then what is this going to be equal to? I mean, this is going to be uh, infinity minus infinity. Uh, and we would just don't define this. So um, the bottom line is you really just you can't do this. And what we're going to do is basically do the next best thing. Um, we'll, we'll just, we'll take a very practical approach uh, to basically looking at all measurable extended real valued functions, but a little more restrictive than that. We'll, we'll restrict the set we're looking at, and then we'll be able to add such functions together, okay? So yeah, all hope is not lost. So before I even get into the details of how to kind of do a workaround about this, let's at least prove that real valued measurable functions basically form a vector space. And that's, that's not hard. Um, let's also prove that you can multiply real, real valued measurable functions and still be measurable. So we have the following proposition. So let's say we have two real valued measurable functions. Uh, 
here. Um, so one, linear combinations, if alpha and beta are real, then this is also measurable. So the fact that you can multiply by a scalar and still be measurable is very easy. The fact that you can add two measurable functions and, and stay measurable is, is quite a bit harder. And if you try to do it for homework, you, there's a good chance uh, you, you'd probably think about it and then not, you know, it, it's tricky. Uh, I, I always, I even forget the trick uh, on how to do it um, quite often. So F times G is also measurable. Okay, so what's the proof? Um, so let's assume alpha, let's first uh, prove that I can just, let's just first look at this. Let's assume beta is zero. And let's just prove that alpha F is measurable if, uh, F is measurable. So if alpha is zero, so this is zero uh, times F. This is trivially measurable. Okay, so assume alpha is not equal to zero. Well, we got two cases, alpha positive. So if alpha is positive, Then the inverse image of alpha f um, c to infinity. Uh, nothing really too special here. You can really do any of the four intervals. Um, well, L, um, f is real valued, so this obviously is going to be. Um, put this back up here. So this is going to be equal to um, the set of all x and e, where alpha f of x uh, is, well, bigger than c. Okay. okay uh, c is a real number. And so this is going to be equal to, let's just divide both sides by alpha. Just a set of all x such that L, uh, f of x is bigger than c over alpha. <clears throat> so this is just trivially going to be the inverse image of uh, c over um, sorry. the inverse image of um, C over alpha to infinity. So, uh, yeah, not a whole lot to uh, that. And if alpha is negative, it's basically the uh, same thing. Just gotta be careful, just switch over the inequality. So if alpha is negative, um, this is going to be, uh, well, this is exactly the same thing. So of all x and e, where uh, alpha f of x is bigger than c. Well, divide by alpha this is going to be, because alpha is negative, it's going to be flipped. Okay. Well, this is going to be inverse image of minus infinity to C. over alpha, and that's also measurable. I forgot to say this is measurable. 
Okay, so uh, alpha f is measurable. Okay, so uh, it's enough to prove that f plus g is measurable. Then, uh, in general, this whole thing, one will be proved. Okay. Um, right, so, um, so how do we prove that? Let's make a little uh, remark that's kind of trivial at the same time, extremely useful. So this is less than C, if and only if, well, I'm not doing anything terribly deep here to subtract G of X, F and G are both real values, so no, no issue there. This is true if and only if, There exists a rational Q, nothing special about the rationals. All I care about is Q in a dense, count, a countable dense subset of real numbers. The rationals are as good as anything. If you have any doubt, pro prove this yourself. That F of X is less than C minus G of X, if and only if f of x is less than q is less than c minus g of x for some rational q. Okay, uh, and this is true if and only if, uh, well, trivially, f of x is less than q. I want to translate this into um, uh, an intersection and a union in a second, so that's why I'm writing it like this. And g of x is less than c um, uh, yeah, so uh, g of x is less than c minus uh, q. Yeah, uh, that's right. Sorry about that. For some q and uh, the rationals. All right, so how does this help us? Well, uh, in some sense, this is the trick to doing this. So let's look at F plus G inverse image. Um, let's look at minus infinity to C. Well, this is just set at all x, where this is less than c. And let me write this in the following funky way. And if you have any doubts, carefully prove this. But we basically just proved this a moment ago. So I can write this as the union. So remember, this is true. It's exactly what I have uh, here. If and only if f of x is less than q and g of x is less than c minus q for some q rational q. So I can rewrite that as uh, the following. Um, x and e where f of x less than q union Um, I guess there's really no need for a bracket here. Right, so both of these have to be true. Uh, F of X has to be less than Q and G of X has to be less than C minus Q. And so this is X and E. Uh, G of X. So I should mention this actually has been asked as a prelim problem, so definitely pay attention. You know, could very well be asked as another prelim problem. Uh, don't know, but maybe. Okay, well, the point here is that uh, this here 
is uh, the inverse image of um, minus infinity to Q. And we're assuming F is measurable. This here is the inverse image of um, minus infinity to C minus Q. That's also measurable. Well, we have the countable union of the intersection of two measurable sets, which is hence measurable. So that's measurable and that proves one, and we really need one to prove two. And there's a nice little trick here, do that. It's very easy, but... Um, For two, uh, let's just write F times G on kind of a trivial way, F plus G squared minus F squared minus G squared. So it's enough to show that um, H squared is measurable if H is also measurable. Okay, well, there's really not a whole lot to that. Um, right, so... Let's assume C, uh, well, H of X is, H of X squared is obviously always bigger or equal to zero. So assume C is, well, bigger or equal to zero. So H of X is bigger than C for C bigger or equal to zero. If and only if, now H itself could be positive or negative. No. Well, one of these has to be obviously true. H has to be bigger than square root of C or less than minus square root of C. So uh, H squared minus one this here is gonna be equal to just the inverse image of square root of C to infinity uh, union, running out of room, so I'll put this here, inverse image uh, minus infinity to square root of C. And by assumption, they're both measurable. So that, that basically takes care of it. Right, so yeah, that finishes up the proof. And the real challenge, or not really challenge, it wasn't hard, but it was a little tricky, was proving that the sum of two um, real valued measurable functions is measurable. So this is measurable. And that well, this little tiny rectangle here takes care of the proof. All right, so let's just get to it. Um, okay, so let's see uh, what we can do about uh, getting some practical solution to this problem of not being able to turn this into a vector space.
So the trick is to uh, restrict ourselves to extended real valued functions that are finite almost everywhere. They're real valued almost everywhere. Okay. They're only possibly uh, plus or minus infinity on a set of measure zero. So, um, right, so uh, before I, I do that, I want to just say, um, let's just assume F and G are just in general um, extended real valued functions. So we say, and we're, uh, you know, if we were able to get through all of integration theory, we would use this terminology dozens of times, if not probably a few, you know, a few dozen times. Uh, so it's good to introduce it as early as possible. We say F equals G almost everywhere on E. Well, it really doesn't require definition. We, we should know what that means. I'll just remind you of what that means. It means the set where this is false, set of all x and e, where f of x does not equal g of x, has zero measure. Okay. So f of x equals g of x, except on possibly a subset of e that has measure uh, zero. Okay. All right, so we have the following proposition. And that says well, two things. So for this proposition, let's assume that F is a measurable extended real valued function. As always, assume that is measurable. Okay. Um, yeah, so if we also have another function g, we don't know if it's measurable, but let's assume that f equals g almost everywhere on E, then I claim G is measurable. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, not really all that much to this. And two, um, this is something we'll use uh, later on, but it's pretty straightforward, so let's prove it. Um, Let's say D is anything measured. I claim F is measurable if and only if F restricted to D, which is a perfectly fine function on D, and F restricted to E take away D, are both measurable. Okay, so the proof of one is, uh, yeah, straightforward. So let's just say A, the set of all X, where F of X is not equal to G of X. And we know that has measure zero. then kind of do the obvious thing, look at something like this, c to infinity. You can really look at any one of the one through four, check that this is measurable. So just look at the set where f equals g and where f is not equal to g. Equal to g. So it's g uh, inverse image.
intersect uh, A, this joint union, C to infinity, intersect A, complement. Right. Well, uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, so um, this is uh, well, this has measure zero. So hence it's measurable. And here, this is going to be equal to well, on a complement f equals g. So this is going to be the inverse image of C to infinity. And it's assumed measurable because F is measurable. So F equals G almost everywhere means basically by definition uh, it is measurable. Or rather by definition, that means G is measurable. So that takes care of one. Uh, two. Let's assume both functions here are measurable. Uh, do basically the same thing, or do something kind of similar, not the same thing, but. So let's look at, uh, and again, it really doesn't matter what we look at, what kind of interval one through four, anything one through four works. So let's write this as a set of all X and E. Well, sorry, this is a set of all X and E where uh, F of X is greater than C. And just write this as set of all X and D where F of X is greater than C. This joint union, uh, make that a little neater and tighter. Uh, this is just this joint union, X and E, where, uh, sorry, X and E take away D. So either X is in D or X is in E take away D. And well, this is by definition of the restriction um, following. So, yeah, not, not really just uh, unraveling. Uh, disjoint union, F restricted to E take away D. Inverse image. C to infinity, and by assumption, both of these are measurable. So, um, uh, let me see. So yeah, that takes care of one half, and the other half is not really too much harder. Yeah, so uh, for the other half, uh, let me just squeeze this in because I don't want to, I'm running out of space here for Zoom. Uh, Okay, so uh, conversely, um, yeah, if, if F is measurable, uh, 
uh, sorry about that. Um, so let's assume F, uh, is measurable. So if F is measurable, then we can just, uh, just write this in kind of a trivial way. that well what is this this is literally a set of all x and d so i hope i'm not insulting anyone's intelligence by unraveling everything so i feel like it's maybe so simple it's deceptive some of these little unraveling proofs well what is this this is uh, and you can just check this yourself it's the inverse image of just f C to infinity intersect, uh, move that up a bit. I don't know how visible it is. But yeah, it's just the regular inverse image. C to infinity intersect D, not E. Well, my assumption is D is measurable, E is measurable. So if F is measurable, then certainly this whole thing is measurable. Similarly, um, yeah, so similarly, uh, this here, This is going to be measurable. And so both of these uh, restricted functions are measurable. Okay. okay, so let's get to it. Let's do exactly what I was saying we should do. And there's really no general uh, there's no like general accepted um, notation for this. So I'm kind of just making up my no own notation here. Usually you do this in the context of what's called a LP space. And we get to that uh, you know, in integration videos. Um, but so let's say V star, for lack of anything else to call it. There's a set of all um, extended real valued functions that are measurable. But where f of x is real valued almost everywhere on E. So again, what does that mean by definition? We're saying F, did the set where F is plus or minus infinity has measure zero. Okay. And that's real, that's pretty realistic. Um, you know, remember we were looking at, a, you know, like the, the, the whole motivation uh, for doing extended real value functions was, was to look at something like, you know, x to the minus one half on zero to one and to do this kind of integration without limits. So here certainly, uh, well, we haven't proved that square root um, is measurable yet. Um, we haven't done anything like that quite yet. Um, so we don't quite know that this is measurable, but uh, assuming this, this will, we will prove that this is a measurable function on zero to one, a measurable extended real value function on zero to one. Uh, but certainly if that's true, it would be in this set here because it's the set where uh, this function here is plus or minus infinity is just zero. That, that's single. That's a singleton. 
Uh, it certainly measures zero. So x and minus one half on zero to one is certainly an example of something on this set. Okay. Um, so we're going to do, we're going to um, say V is, uh, we're going to take, um, we're going to find an equivalence relation on um, this V star here. So we say F is equivalent to G f and g and v star if well f equals g almost everywhere on e so for the purposes of the rest of the course the idea is that f and g are basically the same function strictly speaking they're not I mean, the set of all x where they differ could be uncountable if, for example, f is not equal to g on the cancer set. But, you know, the size of where f is not equal to g is assumed to be zero. It has measure zero. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So let's say v is... Uh, if you've seen general quotient spaces in, in uh, you know, advanced linear algebra or wherever, um, this, is a, this is the following quotient space. But uh, if you've never heard of a quotient space, then just pretend I never said anything. Um, and you know, ignore this one, too. Um, well, you know, a quotient space is just the set of all classes for F in this vector space. So like I said, uh, basically, no matter what, you're going to have to basically define this equivalence relation. It's usually defined in terms of when you start doing what's called LP spaces. Uh, the book does something a little differently in chapter uh, three, but I think might as well just get used to this uh, idea that F and G are basically the same if they're equal almost everywhere on your domain. Okay, um, right, so let's say we have an F and G and uh, V star. Let's say I F, I for infinity, is a set of all X and E, where F of X, well, is infinite. And define I G basically the same way. Just a set of all x and e, where g of x is either infinity or plus infinity. Okay, uh, so something important to note is that, um, well, it's pretty trivial, but still useful, that this spike uh, subactivity has measure zero, because we're assuming both of these have measure zero. So zero plus zero is zero. Okay. Um, right, so what's the point? Clearly there's no ambiguity in defining F plus G as long as we avoid this icky uh, you know, infinity minus infinity, or, you know, as long as we avoid that kind of icky thing, then there's no problem defining this. 
more precisely, let's eliminate, let's excise. Um, so let me start using this, uh, this for set difference because this already is reserved for my equivalence relation. So, um, or maybe I could, uh, it's a little, yeah, maybe it makes a little more sense to do uh, this here. And if, if you don't remember what this means, this is the set of all G, uh, um, oops, sorry, star here. This is a set of all G and V star uh, where G is, um, oh, sorry. Let me put this in uh, yellow. So this here is a set of all G and V star, where uh, F in general is equivalent to G, whenever you have an equivalence relation. Just it's an equivalence class. It's just a set of all stuff that's equivalent to F. Basically. Okay, so uh, yeah, this here is certainly well defined. So I guess I can still use the notation for set difference. Yeah, so as long as neither f nor g are, are plus or minus infinity, certainly we can add f plus g. Um, so this makes sense. In a sense, that's a well defined function. Okay, so what we do is we let uh, psi, I think this is psi. This might seem abstract at first, but the emphasis is that throughout, we just don't care what functions look like on a set of measure zero, and hence it's not that weird, I guess. So let's say, um, Let's give this function a name, asterisk, let's say asterisk, asterisk here, because we already used a blue asterisk, I think. Um, so let's say this is any extension of uh, this function here. So this function is defined on E take away this set of measure zero, but to get a genuine function, we just want to uh, redefine it on this set of measure zero. And the point here is that we don't care how we redefine it. It's gonna be redefined on a set of measure zero. And we just don't care about sets of measure zero. I mean, when we do integration theory, we really, really won't care about sets of measure zero. Because you integrate over any set of measure zero, I don't care what you integrate, as long as it's a measurable function, you're gonna get zero. So yeah, just trying to kind of slowly creep into your brain that a lot of, for, for this course, we just don't care about sets of measure zero in, in some sense. Um, yeah. To all of E, again, IE, um, we already have it defined on E take away the set of measure zero. So let's redefine it to be whatever, we don't care what it is on IF union IG. All right. Um, so now we can finally add two functions up. Well, really, we're adding two of these classes up. Um, yeah, so define the two class F plus the class G to be this class uh, here. 